Hello, my name is Rosa Galvez. And I'm an environmental engineer, but also a senator at the Canadian Parliament. I want to thank your um, uh, wonderful university of um, Fraser Valley, uh, and in particular to Dr. Lucy Lee, uh, for her kind invitation so I can share my experience and my profession uh, with the students and with academic staff and, and everybody who wants to listen to, to my experience. Uh, I have a presentation, uh, it would last approximately 30 minutes and um, I hope you will enjoy it and I hope to um, have the chance to exchange with you uh, once this, uh, uh, this presentation is, uh, is finished. OK, so uh, absolutely, we need more science in politics. And um, um, uh, I feel that uh, um, not only in the, in the parliamentary politics, but also at the municipal level, at the community level, at the provincial level. Um, so how did I came to become a senator? I, I was born in Lima, Peru, and um, I always wanted to be an engineer. I always liked math, physics, chemistry, and uh, I did a, a bachelor in um, a combination of civil and chemical engineering with some biology uh, and get out with a specialization in uh, sanitary engineering. So mostly in the, the area of water and wastewater treatment. When I immigrated to Canada because I married a, a Canadian journalist in, in, in Quebec, um, many people advised me that uh, the best way to transition and if you want to continue in your field uh, that you had a study, it was good to do um, some uh, more university, more, more studies. I was accepted at McGill, uh, the civil engineering department and uh, into the geotechnical research center. Um, I did a master's and a PhD and the areas of, of those uh, projects were in the areas of uh, wastewater treatment and then on uh, soil decontamination. At that time, uh, Montreal was looking forward to develop uh, the suburbs and uh, uh, we were finding out that uh, as, as in many big cities, the suburbs were um, all landfills or places where waste used to be dumped. So uh, before reconstruction, before uh, building new housing, we needed to do environmental impact assessment and we needed to do um, environmental evaluation on the toxicity of, uh, of these lands and if they need the remediation. So it was a moment in which the remediation um, site field didn't exist. So it was a very uh, motivating to be there at the birth of this new field. Exactly the same thing. So let me keep going. So what type of projects did I develop in the, at Laval University during my um, my uh, my tenure there and I'm still teaching at Laval University and finishing a couple of projects that are, will end uh, in the next couple of years. So for example, you know, uh, we use the ice installs in tons per year um, in the roads, in the highways, in the small streets, um, everywhere. And this salt comes with very strong negative impact. They degrade soil and vegetation. They affect the wildlife and the fresh water biota. Uh, they have corrosive effects on vehicles and infrastructure, especially of concrete and steel. Uh, these are very long um, impacts and they are cumulative. And of course, the maintenance of using the salt and of maintaining the infrastructure is very, very expensive. So, um, we propose research and innovation. First of all, we were studying either superficial water or groundwater. They were never linked in environmental projects. Second, we were studying parts of rivers, parts of lakes as, in, as individualities when all of that system is integrated. So it was the time to develop uh, integrated watershed management and integrated holistic view of how contaminants affect both the environment, the wildlife, sorry, and also the infrastructure. So we had a small lake that used to be um, 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 
countryside lake for for pleasure. And as the city grew, uh, Quebec City grew, uh, all of a sudden this lake became in the middle of an urban uh, environment. And so the poor lake was first receiving the extra nutrients from the agriculture, then it was receiving and we got rid of the forest, so it was receiving all the erosion soil that, that was coming and filling up at a very high speeds. And then with the highways that came in, came this ice, the, uh, the icing salts and the contaminants from the combustion of the cars. So we had to remediate this and we offer um, two remediation projects, one to control the phosphorus in this eutrophic lake and another one to um, collect the, um, the icing salts and uh, to um, treat them before it reaches the, uh, uh, the lake. So it was a multidisciplinary project. It lasted more than five years. We had uh, municipalities involved. We had federal and provincial um, research fund funding uh, organizations involved. We had consulting engineering and we have construction companies because we did pilot projects. So we took um, from the lab scale to a meso scale to a pilot scale our ideas um, to control this, uh, uh, this problem. So uh, what that caused, that caused advances in the field for, uh, and, um, and, and advances in the awareness of people for these problems and advances in the uh, way and the approaches to, to solve this, this problem and, and, and stop from uh, applying band-aid cures that I used to call because sometimes we just put a band-aid or we put the dirt under the carpet and that's the the, the, uh, the solution which is a very short-term solution and instead we were into let's be more sustainable let's build resilience let's let's solve the problems at the source and at the same time so improve our engineering design protect the natural and the built environment and of course you know with it comes the modernization of codes and regulations so in the last picture i show you how the Ministry of Transport of Quebec decided to that now in every single Bretel, you know, these uh, uh, um, these uh, interchangers, um, uh, they they have wetlands uh, mimicking what we did, so to stop the uh, some of the contamination and uh, um, and improve the quality the quality of the superficial water and groundwater. So this is one of those projects. It lasted for several years and uh, um, we, we even had an award uh, from the Transportation um, um, Association in Quebec. And, uh, and, and, and what is very innovative is that the wetland uses halophyte plants that are found in the um, estuary of the St. Lawrence River. So let me talk to you now about uh, these other terrible um, case study. Uh, it was another long, long-term project that we did. So I'm sure you know the derailment uh, that happened in uh, Lac Megantic City in uh, in the summer of 2013. So um, 72 oil field tanks cars belonging to a company called MMA um, derail um, and uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, runaway train hit because it were, was a curve in the downtown of Lag Megantic um, it, it, it it derail and it hit several buildings but what is so incredible about this accident is that it created such a huge explosion that it was seen from the satellite, um, the NASA satellite that um, calculated that the intensity of that explosion was equivalent to 116 of a nuclear explosion and it was seen from, uh, from the satellite. So, uh, 47 people were killed instantaneously. It was a furnace. They were killed in, in seconds and they left many orphans in this small, very small summer uh, city where people go uh, to um, have pleasure and um, 
uh, have activities in, in the water. Um, the temperature hit 3000 degrees. We needed 160 firefighters, 20 pump trucks. It took um, almost two days to stop the fire. Uh, the, the land that was impacted uh, was carbonized down, but the, the, the smoke uh, had an impact on almost 40 hectares uh, of impacted area. And, and because of this happened, this accident happened so close to the Lag Megantic, which it um, has a, as a, as a effluent, the, uh, sorry, as an affluent, the, um, the Shodia River, that, um, that it's an affluent of the, uh, of the um, St. Lawrence River, uh, it, it, this it's provided with a, a path a path of 140 kilometers that the oil travel from Lake Megantic until the St. Lawrence. So th these had a major, major um, impact on the people, impact on the uh, on the infrastructures in the city because it destroyed the commercial center, the pharmacies, the, the malls, the municipality, the, the train station. Um, but also it contaminated the lake, the, the lake and the and the Shodia River and for a very long um, transit. So um, I happened to be there because with some friends from my McGill school time, uh, we usually rent cabins there to to spend some time and we were there. So it was an uh, unbelievable experience because we were there the day before and by around 11 o'clock at night, we heard some uh, um, noises and we thought it was parties that were taken in that um, in, in the city and uh, it was very hot day and uh, by uh, two o'clock in the morning, uh, uh, I, I get up because there were some noises and uh, I realized that there was no light, there was no electricity, there was no water. And uh, the, the next day when I opened my, my cell, I, I realized that all my family was looking for, uh, for, um, for us, for me and my husband, my friends, because they knew what happened. And so um, I also uh, had calls from uh, journalists that, that, that knows me because of my expertise and uh, were calling me to uh, wanting to have my opinion on what was happening. And I said, I cannot believe what you're saying because I'm right here. So they, uh, I get some um, permits from uh, uh, the journalist and uh, I got to go at the red zone where the fire was still going. So I saw with my own eyes the, 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 the people, the sadness and the, the panic and the uh, lost walking in the downtown of the people. And I saw the, the, the 10 meters uh, high flames and, and I know that they were using water to cool down the tanks and that uh, not to stop the fire. And when I asked why they are doing that is because they say we don't know what's in it. And I said, I heard there is oil and they say, yeah, but it's not the same type of oil. But shouldn't you fire workers know what is the type of oil you are fighting? No. So, you know, if that's why it took so long. The, um, uh, um, a petroleum company, a refinery in Quebec sent uh, foams to uh, and help them to um, ca um, stop the fire. Well, so. Why is this important for politics? So, you know, we know that when we base uh, our development on evidence, on facts, they produce sustainable development. It is more reliable than, than, than uh, dogmas, than ideologies, and that, that traditional politics uh, way of um, legislating, which, is, uh, which, which can change which can change depending on the on the, um, the, the, the ideas, you know. So in, for example, you know, uh, liberalism can say uh, as a dogma that liberating the markets 
uh, are the best thing way to go and just just point an arrow there and to live, uh, liberate markets. However, today with COVID, we know we know that our PPP, our protect personal protection equipment was coming from overseas and we were not prepared and that our vaccines and our um, farm, uh, pharmaco um, our pharmaceuticals uh, products are also coming from uh, from outside. So, you know, this was a very short term uh, vision. And on the other side, you know, conservative that says deregulation, deregulation. Well, deregulation is what cost what what caused the lack megantic and what caused the um, the uh, the problem with the de-icing salts because they say deregulate no 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 government the smallest government and and also you remember too that in conservative um, governments they muscle science because they don't want people to be telling the facts so we need to change that and find a just equilibrium between between the both. So let me take you to the um, to the Senate. So at the Senate we have 105 seats right now, occupied mostly by independents. Then there is the caucus of the conservative. There are two new groups, uh, one called Progressive Senate Group, which used to be liberal, and we have a new Canadian senator group, which is composed of uh, cons conservative that left the, their caucus to form a new sort of progressive conservative. There are six, six non-affiliated. The number of um, senators goes with the numbers of population in each province and territory. Uh, there is one scientist and there is two people with uh, uh, doctorates. Uh, there is only one engineer and there is also one Latin American person of origin, which is me. There are currently 10 vacancies and uh, they are accepting uh, um, applications and these uh, vacancies are, I think, four in Quebec, and uh, the others, unfortunately, I don't, I don't recall right now. What I do in the Senate, um, um, for example, last year we had a, a big bill which was the modernization of the Impact Assessment Act. There were major changes, as I told you, um, in for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, environmental regulations were disappearing, disappearing. We used to have one of the best in the world environmental regulations in the 70s. And then in the, starting in the in the late 80s, we start losing some of this. Uh, and, and what was a comprehensive, very highly structured framework, environmental protection framework by taking spots of the regulations, we we left a, like a screen with big holes where everything was passing. So at the point we have projects that were not going into environmental impact assessment. I learned that, for example, in Alberta, it's a program that does that is a software and that is the the uh, promoters. They fill it up in online and in three minutes they got their permit. Um, um, there was no consideration of uh, cumulative effects. There is no consideration of how some projects affect some uh, vulnerable populations. So, of course, we needed a modernization. It was due many years before to be modernized. It was delayed and finally last year it, it, it passed. It's not the best thing. There are many things that still needs to be to be um, uh, integrated, but at least we, we are in, in this path now. Um, what is why is so important that we do this environmental impact? I can tell you uh, about size C, dam B, C. The, 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 again, the Norway Territories government asked me to do uh, as my opinion and my uh, study on uh, what was the impact, the impact of the size C in the Mackenzie in the Mackenzie uh, watershed that I just that I just um, told you about and. Uh, that is like I did that, I think, eight years ago, and I already said what were the problems with Site C, economical problems, technical problems, um, impact on the vulnerable population, indigenous people, um, environmental impacts, and that um, the economics was 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 not evident. And and yet, you know, ten years after, despite of exactly of this science of this evidence that was put there. 
still the project went ahead and now they are talking about not building it anymore and now it will cost if we don't build it. So there is so much inefficiency and so much of time and resources and energy waste because its decisions are driven by politics, ideologies, ideas, short term, short term uh, reason. Why we need science in Parliament? Well, again, you know, we continue on that. Um, it's important to say that uh, um, what is happening in the coronavirus? Look at the incredible heterogeneity of uh, of the things that are happening. You have six countries that have that are examples of uh, how they are managing and really controlling the the COVID. You have um, countries such as uh, Taiwan, New Zealand, um, South Korea, uh, Vietnam, and um, and um, Scotland and um, in in Iceland and uh, and if you see one of the main uh, main reasons is that they have follow uh, very closely what science is said in the past concerning pandemics but also what science is saying as as long as it's developing the vaccine as it's, uh, as long as is knowing more this this different virus so uh, this is very important and uh, uh, you will see that countries that have completely denied the, uh, the science and the facts and the and the evidence are really suffering a lot. And just to name two of them, um, you have our neighbors in the United States and you have Brazil and South America. Um, this government has put it in the platform that they want to bring science to parliament. Um, I, I know some efforts and I really appreciate that they name and re renew the mandate of uh, Dr. Mona Nemer as the Chief Science Advisor of Canada and that she's following the COVID and putting a special emphasis on the on children. This is extremely important and you will notice that there is still a difference between uh, how women deal in politics and how men deal in politics. Uh, just to mention the six countries that I was talking about how they they manage well COVID well they are six women leaders in these countries. I think it is because um, women tend to collaborate more and uh, we are less in competition and um, also women we are you know the, the the caregivers and we are the the reproducers in in the human life and so it, uh, we are linked to our children and to our grandchildren and so that pushes us to think in terms of generations and not short term um, issues. The Senate has a program called Senate Engage, which engage uh, young people and uh, I participate as many times as I can because I think that one of my important goals is to not only to raise awareness because I've been raising awareness for the last four years, but it's to change, change and leave a, a planet of better quality for future generations. And I also want that the young people uh, raise their voice and that we hear them because they are concerned. There are some suffering there, emotional suffering and also environmental quality suffering because of the, the less better quality of air, water and and the and the, um, and the food that we that we uh, that we need. So there is this program and I hope you will keep using it all universities because it's a it's a very good interesting mechanisms to engage with uh, with senators. Um, there is another one, science meets parliament, and we have uh, scientists coming to parliament. I have, that's the way I, I met with uh, uh, Dr. Lee, and it was so, so nice. I have met with many others, 
and uh, it, it provides with benefits to both scientists and to politicians. So to scientists is to have a direct communication and direct influence like the lobbies, you know, uh, and gain first hand information and experience. Um, and also that it will influence the, uh, the research. Uh, and not only the industry will influence the research, but the, the legislation will influence the research. And of course, for politicians, because then there is so much education to do with politicians on so many aspects on science. And uh, um, I am sad to say that uh, a politician, the main quality is to know how to speak and know how to communicate. And, uh, and, 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 and that's what we look for a politician, a, a good speaker, a, a beautiful person that knows how to speak. But if you, now I'm here four years and I can tell you how disappointed I am that one day I hear a politician say one plus one is two and the next, next day say one plus three is nine. And, you know, and, and it's like that and you have to believe it because he says that in, in that way. So that that really have to change from both sides. So politician needs to to know, not take for granted that the population uh, won't know because we know a lot and uh, and for populations to demand and uh, ask for accountability. Um, there is another partnership uh, for science and engineering in NSERC, the PAGSE um, program uh, that allows for um, um, uh, opportunity to gather uh, uh, um, scientists and, and, and politicians. So I go to, I used to go, now with COVID we are not going, but uh, to um, to go to this breakfast where we have a, a, a well-known uh, scientist coming and, and talking to us. And we have been doing it for 25 years. So I, I hope we will renew this as soon as we can. How to participate in a parliamentary study? So there are many ways. Committees, um, we, uh, senators participate in 20 something committees and these committees do uh, important study. I was the chair of the uh, Energy, Environment and Natural Resources Permanent Senatorial Committee and we do the three-year study on decarbonization of our economy and we look at every sector, the heavy industry, the transport, the energy industry um, and the uh, agriculture and, uh, and we produce uh, four reports. Um, during these pandemics, uh, the uh, National Finances uh, um, Committee, who I am also a member, uh, we produce a report, COVID-19 relief in times of crisis, um, and where we hear witnesses coming to tell us what's going on, the government, the, the different sectors. This study was done in a hurry. Uh, it's an interim report, and we hope to, when we renew our committee activities, we will I hope we will start with a clean recovery. So what brings me to a clean and just recovery? My office has the initiative too because I'm an independent senator. I don't need no, to ask permission to nobody to start a study by myself. So as a researcher, as an engineer, as a scientist, and now as a legislator, um, I am very close to many things that are happening with respect to the COVID and its impact on the health, on the um, on the health and on the economy of people, but also on the on the on the industries, on the workers. And so I have prepared with my team uh, a clean and just recovery um, white paper, a discussion paper, uh, where we want to put people before corporations and with a special emphasis on social and environmental well-being. Uh, this paper includes costs and benefits of the recovery, um, and we talked about sustainable prosperity. Um, we know that uh, we are in the same boat of COVID-19, sorry, in the same storm. Uh, this is a storm that has uh, uh, scanned the whole of the planet. Uh, but um, not not everybody's in the same boat. Vulnerable populations such as women, indigenous people and racialized individuals are uh, are being affected in a stronger and more intense way than the many others. 
and this needs to be taken care when we plan a, 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 a recovery. So um, we want to transition into a low carbon economy. To tell you the truth, the, more, the word transition, it's being used for so long now. I think it's almost more than 10 years. It is not a transition anymore. So I am tend to use the word transformation. Um, we need to mitigate and we need to adapt. We, would, we need to reduce uh, carbon emissions and we need to adapt to the extreme weather events that are destroying our infrastructures and our lives. And, uh, and this is very important. There is a lot, as I mentioned, of inefficiency uh, with respect to energy, with respect to materials. You will, I don't know if you will surprise to know that more than 70% of all the material that is extracted from nature end up in landfills, end up wasted. There is an average um, uh, usage of, uh, for some type of products, days, for some products, months, and for some products, years, uh, but uh, at the end, it ends up in, in landfills. So we have to change the vision of climate change um, climate change situation from a burden to a, a, a moment of opportunity and, and make a transformation in our socio-economic model of living because infinite growth in a planet of finite resource is illogical, it's, uh, it's, uh, um, it's irrational, it, it it's not goes with science. Um, so some of these opportunities that I was talking to you about. So we have opportunities. There is, it is the time. There are many that are low hanging fruits that should have been used. Like for example, um, the building codes that I, I also wrote a paper, a white paper on building codes. And please ask me right to my office, and we will be very happy to bring you all of these um, of all of these informations uh, to your hands. Uh, as soon as we can. Um, so why to bring science to policy in general? Because science and technology and science and uh, and, and yes, and and an economy based on on knowledge will bring performance, will bring resilience, will bring environmental and health benefits, and it will have public approval. On the contrary, if we continue as business as usual and keep uh, helping traditional indus polluting industries, uh, we will keep uh, increasing the risk for the safety and the health of the people. We will have a stranded assets and, and it's not ethical because we need to leave this planet in better conditions for future generations. And actually, you know, the wildlife also have some rights in this planet. So for all of that, I think that um, we have to invest in our collective future well-being, and for that we have to in, have indicators that tell us how good we are doing in this area. So with that, I thank you very much. I hope uh, you enjoyed this presentation, and that uh, I'm ready for your uh, for your questions. <laughs>